Hey everybody, we're going to get started. <coughs> Welcome to Austin JavaScript. We have some exciting stuff this yeah. month. We have yeah. Anton who's going to speak for us about single page app. I'm told that Spa actually saying I really misunderstood. Same. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. That's uh, that's uh, and we're. It's time to first. Side content. Uh, and we're really excited to announce our new co-organizer. Coincidentally and unrelatedly, Magento has sponsored this. Uh, so I uh, will talk about that in just a sec. But first, we're going to do the code of conduct. Yeah, yeah. So the code of conduct is um, uh, a formalization of our already great culture here at Austin JS. PLDR, be excellent to each other. Um, if you see anything, hear anything that falls short of our code of conduct, um, please let one of the organizers uh, monitor you right now. And uh, we'll take care of it. And this is up at uh, awesomejavascript.com, and there's a link. And you can click on the link right So the plan is that Antoine's going to, well, actually, start first. Andrew's going to give a brief spiel. Um, Antoine's going to Tell us uh, what he's going to tell us, which I'm super excited to hear about. And after that, we'll take a brief break, do some Q&A. We'll, we'll do a little Q&A first, then we'll do a brief break. More Q&A, maybe just talk about topics if people have questions about, like, you know, what the heck is a service worker, that sort of thing. Um, and then once we wrap things up, alas, the ginger man is no more, well, it's reborn on the side, supposedly. Um, so we're going to go half or a block further north. To the Baca Street Bar. Um, we'll trade in some beer selection in return for a full bar, as well as uh, the, uh, the Surf and Turf Cowboy Taco Place, which is legit. So if you don't like pizza, you can have Cowboy Taco. And I think, I think there's some animal. Yeah. So, Anything? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Special place in my heart. All right, so hi, my name is Anton Astashov. I'm a software engineer slash like front-end tech lead, I guess, uh, at Mixbook. And today I'm gonna tell you how we are making uh, Mixbook Home fast, uh, how we were making and still making. And most of the work was like uh, front-end involved, like I don't know, TypeScript, React, Webpack, all that fancy buzzwords. So I thought they're gonna be a great topic to talk about at this meetup. Cool things. Uh, all right, so what's Mixbook? Mixbook is a kind of online photo book slash card slash editor uh, slash calendar slash wall or slash whatever uh, editor. So you can design your like photo book there and then like either from the scratch or like using some existing design, uh, just change it a little bit and then you order it, pay for it and it's gonna be delivered to your door. So this is the editor uh, on the screenshot. And recently we rewrote it in TypeScript and Redux and React. Uh, we used to have a Flex app. So now it's a kind of shiny TypeScript application. But in this talk, I'm not gonna, focus, uh, I'm not gonna be focused on the uh, editor. I'm gonna talk about the storefront perform uh, performance. So the storefront is a place where you can actually can choose one of the designs and then kind of create a book of it, out of it, and then pay for it, and basically that's it, place an order. Uh, so why do we care about performance? So basically there's a lot of evidence like floating around on the internet stating that if you like increase your performance by X, you will get like conversion rate improvement by Y. And I don't know, you want to read that if you want, but basically all of that just says like we increased our performance by X and got Y kind of percent improvement and that was super cool and we got rich like everybody. Uh, so that was like uh, always kind of, uh, that was a compelling idea for a mixed book, like let's maybe try to invest more into performance. But when we tried it, just like basically like, let's improve like performance with just one page. And then we run an experiment and actually it's neutral. So we're like, all right, probably doesn't work. Um, and then basically there was a service which we tried uh, called Yoda. It's like a drop-in solution 
which sounds super scary. You are basically you are rerouting kind of uh, your DNS records to their servers. So all the traffic goes through them, and they kind of inject some JavaScript to your pages, kind of doing some magic magical stuff, uh, kind of rearranging the assets, making like asynchronous whatever is possible, and somehow that increases the performance, kind of, at least perceived performance of your application. So uh, we kind of measure it. Uh, so we established the experiment, an A-B experiment, ran it for a couple months, also kind of was, were gathering the performance metrics from our users, which was basically just the stuff from what's like window performance timing object, just kind of sending that stuff to our kind of database. Um, and after two months, we got the results, which are which look like this, and that is quite impressive. I mean, like I was skeptical at first, but it seems like it really worked, and they really kind of improved performance, and that kind of increased our conversion rate by ten percent. So this is pretty huge. Still scary because like we are basically giving out uh, the control of like basically like sending all the traffic to them. So maybe the, ex the experiment is still not clean, right? Because we are kind of sending the traffic. Maybe they're slowing down kind of the original treatment of the experiment or doing some shady stuff there. We don't know, basically. So, but still, it's highly unlikable, but kind of we still want to prove it. Maybe like build on top of that. And yeah, so basically after kind of people, kind of stakeholders and stuff, they saw everybody at Mixbook saw these numbers, they were basically looking like that guy, like, yeah, great. And like they formed a team, like, okay, so like, let's form a team, and apparently I'm a part of it, and let's go for those results. So we want to prove that basically whatever we did with Yoda, actually works, the performance really matters. So we're gonna try to improve the performance uh, without Yoda. So first we're gonna build on top of Yoda, then we try to remove Yoda and see what's gonna happen. And we want to go for like 85% improvement in size speed. I have no idea, frankly, what number, where they, that number kind of comes from, but still. And hopefully it will lead to 33% uh, improvement of conversion rate in addition to Yoda's 10%. And basically, if that works fine, we're gonna be the, like, like that, that guy in a tank top, right? Um, so I have my own gold standard of super performance site. And this is dev.2. If you never seen it, it's basically like where developers can talk about, I don't know, their developer stuff. Uh, mostly like front-end focused. And it's a pretty cool site, there's nice content and friendly community. But the cool thing about it, it's so freaking fast. You just like, sometimes I just go there and just click around the links. It's like, ah, oh. just like you click it, it immediately appears. Like, so cool. It's like, in my opinion, this is how internet should work. You just like click a link, immediately thing, like, kind of pops up right into your face. So cool. So I wanted Mixbook to be like that fast too. And the problem with that, Mix.com is a 12 years uh, old application which is written in Ruby on Rails. And if you ever work with the code bases which are like 12 years old, you know that it's usually a mess, right? Because like even if all the developers are like super good and professional and they did the right thing, the code base will like eventually rot anyway. Like there's a, gonna be tech depth here and there. Multiple generations of developers like went through like this code. Most of the people who actually work that code, like they don't work at Mixbook anymore. And so everybody were not super excited on kind of working heavily with that code base. So, but this project is actually a great excuse to rewrite everything from the scratch. Like a, I don't know, like a secret desire of each and every developer, right? build it right finally, make it perfect. Usually that doesn't go well. <laughs> For us, I'm still not sure. <laughs> Hopefully it will. <laughs> so, but yeah, so the idea was 
we're going to extract all the front end part from Rails. Uh, and we build like a Node.js Node app, like a front end, back end, so to say. Uh, we're going to keep Rails only for API, so we're still going to go to Rails for all the kind of the database stuff. We're going to migrate it gradually, like page by page, establish an A-B experiment to measure basically the, our performance uh, treatment versus like original Ruby on Rails treatment. And that was actually a great idea, so highly recommend to do that. A-B experiments are not just for marketing team, they're good for developers. Because like there was a lot of cases when kind of we are actively developing while running that experiment, and then suddenly kind of experiment goes down. But all kind of our reporting systems are like fine. And then we figure out we actually broke something. And the only thing which actually kind of catches it is conversion goes down, like project starts go down, and people actually not really complaining about it. So and they're like, ah, what what's what's going on? So we find it and then fix it and then kind of it improves. So that was a kind of great idea to do that. Also kind of gathering the performance metrics, uh, same thing as for Yoda. And we're going to make our front end kind of this, this uh, project like fast and also pleasant to develop. So we have two goals. And that kind of pleasant to develop probably is not that hard. Basically anything younger than 12 year old probably going to work. Uh, but anyway, uh, so what we have so far so we have the, um, so our stack is currently this. Uh, we have a custom node JavaScript application, no frameworks, like node Express or nothing, basically just like HTTP and HTTPS uh, from node. And then we have like custom state management, custom routing. We did mostly custom because we wanted the type safety of it and kind of currently existing solutions kind of, I don't know, didn't, satisfy us, I guess. Um, React going to be our view layer because we had a great experience with React while was kind of rewriting the editor. Um, so yeah, everybody at Mixbook, all the developers loves it, love it, and yeah, we're definitely going to use it. It also plays nicely with TypeScript. And again, everybody loves TypeScript. Everybody like our static type fans after the kind of we wrote the editor. So kind of that. Uh, Language was kind of the obvious choice for us. And we're going to use Webpack to build all the things. And when I say kind of there's no frameworks for our custom Node JavaScript application, it's I'm somewhat lied because Webpack is our framework. So we kind of build a lot of things based on Webpack. And I'm going to show later on uh, how we do that. So basically, um, it's pretty trivial stack. Mm, kind of a lot of people use something like this, maybe like except they're using some framework like Next.js or something like that. Um, instead of custom uh, bearable no, no JavaScript application. Uh, but there are some interesting features uh, that are performance related. And yeah, so I want to share uh, them with, with you and like if you, you know something better or like, I don't know, use something like that, please tell, let me know. I'm basically here to kind of gather the feedback and like figure out what I could do better. So first thing, our front end is an isomorphic or should I say universal? Still not sure what's the difference. Um, React application, so we basically render the HTML on the server via like, I don't know, React DOM render to string. And then we kind of reuse it on the client via rehydration, um, which just basically adds the event listeners and triggers the life cycles for all the React components. So if you use React, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so the cool thing about it, first, it's good for SEO, right? Because we are kind of send the HTML to Google bots. And I know Google can work with JavaScript. I have no idea how good it is at that. And just like seems more reliable, just like give the Google bot an HTML and hopefully it's gonna be happy with it. Another th cool thing is performance. So basically, currently, like all our kind of HTML size of all the pages we have is like within 40, 70 kilobytes range. And uh, this is basically the only thing users need to download to see something on the screen. Uh, and then kind of user gonna be distracted while we're kind of downloading the rest 300 kilobytes of scripts 
and like parsing and evaluating them. But this is actually a pretty cool thing that 50 kilobytes, you have something you can actually stare at and that improves the perceived performance. People kind of think that it's actually fast, so it's not really yet. Um, okay, so second thing, the application is a single page application. So which means we don't really, really reload kind of pages when you click a link. We just basically load a page bundle. So we have kind of each page, it's a separate bundle, like J J JavaScript bundle. And then when you kind of navigate between pages, you just like load that page bundle. And in that page bundle, we have like the page logic, which is basically a React component. So we just like add that React component to to your kind of DOM and that's it, kind of, you just render the page. Uh, all the shared stuff goes to the app bundle um, and it actually was pretty easy to configure too because there's like a Webpack split chunks feature which basically do that out of the box. So Webpack already can do uh, splitting to separate bundles, it can kind of share, kind of all the, extract all the shared stuff to a kind of, uh, kind of shared bundle no plugins, it just the webpack can just do that like out of the box. And another cool thing, we can actually preload those bundles. So when you go to like a page, you can either like preload those bundles, which users probably will go, or you can also combine with that with preloading on mouse over. So like when you're moving your mouse over some link, we start to download that bundle. By the time they actually click the link, there are chances that the bundle will be already downloaded or just like halfway through. So people will see the kind of the next page either instantly or with some kind of little delay. So basically that means that usually our every single page require like three bundles. It's polyfills, it's app bundle, and one of the page bundles. So polyfills is about 30K, app is 200K, and page bundles they are like around 50K each. And basically that means that when you click a link, you only need to download those 50K and that's it. And then you can kind of render the page and it's gonna be there, it's gonna be interactive instantly. Um, and yeah, that's pretty cool. So SPA, that, that SPA approach, in my opinion, really makes a difference. This is kind of, the, all those ideas are somewhat similar as dev to site uses. Like I kind of tried to see why they're so fast and they're doing that same trick with kind of moving mouse over the loading the bundle, you click it and it appears instantly. All right, so this is cool, makes the site snappy. How are we gonna deploy it? So we're gonna distribute and deploy those bundles uh, via manifests. As far as I understand, this is kind of a pretty popular approach these days and frankly makes a lot of sense. So. The idea is each asset is immutable forever, never changes. Like once we make it, yeah, it's gonna be there forever. We're gonna cache it in a browser like 10 years from now. And if it ever changes, we're gonna, so it's gonna have a different name. And we're making sure that this is true by kind of prefixing or uh, suffixing it with a fingerprint. So the content changes, Fingerprint gonna be different and browser will have to re-download that bundle. Then we get all those bundles, we dump them into the same S3 folder. So there's like huge, I don't know, list of files in the same directory on S3. There are like, I don't know, 500 those app-something bundles from each and every deploy we did in the past. And then we have that manifest JSON that says what bundles need to be loaded. And that manifest JSON leaves in, uh, on the server. So in a, we basically deploy it whenever we deploy the server that no JavaScript application I uh, told you a little bit earlier. So the manifest JSON looks something like that. So basically whenever we need to get the, uh, for example, app.js bundle, we just um, download stuff from that URL. So Cool thing about it that whenever you make a change, for example, on the main page, you're only gonna change uh, that kind of main.js bundle. And then you deploy your application again. And then uh, after that, the returning user 
will only have to download that main.js because all the other records are the same and already cached in the browser. So we deploy like about one, two times a day. Uh, so basically every day kind of user uh, that kind of returning to our site usually only have to download one, two of those bundles. Uh, so cool thing, it solves the problem of cache invalidation also because basically there's no cache invalidation. It's immutable and we don't really kind of clean it up. Yeah? Yeah, so basically we, uh, the cool thing about it plays nicely with uh, isomorphic app because we can deploy manifest right with the application and basically when we spit out the HTML from Node.js we already bake in kind of all that, that data uh, into the HTML we kind of send from the server. So we, if it would be just like a client app we would have to download manifest first, resolve all this stuff and then start to download them again and that would slow down us a lot. Isomorphic app is way better here. Cool thing also that it was actually pretty simple to add that webpack manifest because there's a webpack manifest plugin already existing. There's probably like plugin for everything almost in webpack. So and it, it works basically out of the box. You just add this plugin, it generates this file and then you just like import it in your Node JavaScript application, use it and that's it. So yeah, pretty cool. Uh, all right, so what's next? So up to this point, I was, uh, we were using some stuff which is basically like generally known of, like SPA, isomorphic app, mm, like there's Next.js which basically doing pretty much the same thing, just worse. <laughs> um, mostly, uh, yeah, people know what it is and like Webpack, Webpack Manifest plugin also kind of pretty popular plugin. But we also wrote a bunch of custom Webpack plugins, which are not open sourced, at least yet. Uh, but I'm gonna tell the, about them you, to you like nevertheless, because I think there are some cool ideas and I'd like to share them. All right, so what we realized that at Mixbook, we, ha we have a lot of data, which is first, small. Second, like ch don't change really often like CMS settings, prices, whatever products we sell, like uh, various promos, and also like even designs we, uh, you can choose. So we have like about 15,000 designs uh, for all the different like products, for like cars, books, whatever. So total about 15,000. This is not really big data. This is not even medium data. This is pretty much small data, and we can actually bake in that small data right into the bundles so we don't have to like to call them and then after that basically for example if we render the all the designs we're gonna have the pagination filtering sorting right there on the client side we don't have to like make a request like at all and Zilia Grigoric said fastest request is request not made and this is I guess true <laughs> hard to argue about it uh, so the only thing like we need to automate that because like for example when somebody changes stuff in CMS we basically have to trigger rebuild and redeploy of our Node JavaScript application. And <clears throat> well not only Node JavaScript application but also kind of the, uh, the, client bundle, the client bundles. So and we did that with a custom webpack loader. So how it works? It basically loads the .remote.json files and they contain the URLs of the data and the schema. And basic and yeah, loader kind of loads the data, validates the schema, and yeah, bakes in that uh, data into the bundle. Yeah, so cool thing about it, it happens during the build time. If it happens during the build time, we can add guarantees, we can add build time checks. Like that's why we have the JSON schema for that. So we like we load the uh, data. We also load the schema, we validate uh, data with the schema if it kind of doesn't match, we fail the build, we generate typings, TypeScript typings from the schema and also can basically use those TypeScript typings uh, through the, um, the code base. So now I'm going to show how it works. <coughs> so the products.remote.json usually looks like this, it's just two URLs where to get data from. 
So, and during the build, Webpack will fetch those um, endpoints. So, imagine like the kind of the products, the data endpoint, like, I don't know, something like this, pretty simple. And the schema endpoint returns not that simple JSON, but this is fine. The JSON schema is like overall, it's pretty hard to read. And, but there's a lot of tools for that and you can generate typings from that schema. So we're, gonna, we're still gonna use it just because it's a standard. Uh, and Webpack generates that simple module, uh, just basically exports that uh, JSON guts like from the remote server. And also, at the same time, it's also going to generate the typings file. And that typings file will uh, give us kind of the structure uh, of our data. And we can use that structure through our code base, just like basically import, for, for example, iProduct. Yeah, and use it. So it looks basically like this. So again, this is the generated module. This is the typings. This is how we use it. Uh, so, for example, in case name disappears from the data, like there is no name anymore, we kind of drop that column, some backend folks drop that column. They forgot to update the schema, we're gonna have a failing build. They dropped name and they dropped uh, from, from the data and they dropped name from the schema uh, the generated typings will not can have the name field. Again, we're gonna have a failing build because we forgot to update our code base. So this is pretty cool, in my opinion. And this is what's the outcome of that. So how bigger our bundles got after kind of that approach. So again, we have about 1000 designs for the photo books. So the CMS and like prices and all that stuff, it's pretty much negligible. It's like a couple kilobytes, several kilobytes. Designs are a little bit bigger. So for example, for 1000 uh, photo books designs, this is pretty much about like 40 kilobytes of gzip JSON. It's not that much. It's really kind of like in the blink of the eye, you can download that. For the cards, it was a little bit worse. So we have about 10,000 card designs, and this is about like 150 of kilobytes of gzip JSON. But still, you download those like 150 kilobytes, and that's it, you don't re really need to make any like remote requests anymore. Just like click around, like filtering, sorting, whatever, everything works in, like instantly. And so basically the outcome, I'm not sure what, gonna, what it's gonna be for the like, cars designs, we didn't finish it yet, we didn't roll it out. But for the books, we rolled it out already. And it's gonna be like, so we have polyfills, 30K, app.js, which is like shared code, it's about 200k. And the book storefront.js, which is basically that kind of page with all the book designs, is just 40, oh sorry, 64k, that including that 40k of gzip JSON. That's it. So we download 70k basically and we have everything there on the front end. And we can generate, since we don't really need to make any remote requests from Node.js app, we generate it like within 40 milliseconds or, or something like that. Uh, I mean, like React generates that HTML. So that means we basically like, after we get the request, for example, I don't know, from Googlebot, we can return like within 50 milliseconds, we can return already some response to it. And Google probably gonna be amazed and will get us to the very first kind of uh, ranks of the search, hopefully. <laughs> um, all right, so one Webpack plugin which was really helpful for tracking bundle sizes for us uh, is Webpack Bundle Analyzer. So during a build, it generates a, like index, index HTML. If you open that index HTML, it will look like this in your browser. And you can move your mouse over and see like exactly how big like one or another model and how much it contributes into to the bundle size. And also another cool thing, you can actually see like exactly where your models go. Like for example, there's like book themes that remote that JSON. We don't want to get it to app.js and like it's always there. And we need to make sure that always only in page bundles because we don't want to add those, those like 40 kilobytes to uh, all the pages, only the pages that need that. 
So in my opinion, if you have like a TV, you know, like that, that hangs near the water cooler or something like that and don't show anything useful, this is actually really useful for the front-end team because uh, if you stare like uh, a lot at this, you will sometimes notice that some kind of import goes not where it's supposed to, and I think it's very valuable. All right, so um, you, by this time, you're probably like tired of me saying Webpack this and Webpack that. But yeah, Webpack is being used really heavily for kind of building all that stuff. Uh, it builds everything, and we pay a price for that. Uh, and the price is it's actually pretty slow to build. Like the full compilation takes about two minutes or so, something like that, a little bit less. But that's including because we have to actually download stuff from the APIs and it takes a while to generate like all those like huge feeds with the designs. Uh, and, but incremental compilation is also pretty slow. It's like about 10 plus seconds. So like for every time, for example, you need to run tests, you have to wait like 10 seconds when your webpack completes the build and only after that you actually can run tests, which also takes a while. So that's a little bit annoying. Uh, as opposed like for example with the editor, we didn't have that problem because everything was built with like TypeScript itself and like all our tests are running like within three seconds. That was pretty cool. But yeah, this is the price we pay for uh, the power and flexibility of Webpack. And configuring Webpack kind of is a meme already in JavaScript world. And it has that reputation of really complicated tool. And sometimes it's kind of tricky to configure it right. And yeah, we have a configuration object that kind of huge JSON which we feed into Webpack, which is like several thousand lines of long, generated by another couple thousand lines of TypeScript code. And yeah, so that was super helpful to use TypeScript for all that stuff. I can't recommend it like uh, high enough. So we have like all the build scripts, all the configuration in TypeScript, and apparently the kind of the typings for Webpack are pretty good. And when you're like writing your custom modules and stuff, you will actually have the auto completion and like highlights the kind of built-in documentation. That actually simplifies writing those, that stuff a lot because when I try to do that in JavaScript, there's like some kind of objects here and there which are pretty complicated and I have no idea what the kind of their shape. So I have like console log each and every of them to figure out like what actually the fields there. With typings, uh, it gets way simpler. So highly, highly, I really highly recommend that, to use TypeScript for all your code, TypeScript forever. <clears throat> all right, so that was actually incredibly powerful pattern, like custom Webpack loaders that emit kind of the JavaScript module and also emit the TypeScript definition file. And we use it a lot. We have like, we wrote several kind of custom loaders like that. So for example, another one, which I'm gonna show you later is the CSS loader, custom Webpack CSS loader. So the idea is we don't want to have any external CSS files like at all. Uh, why? Because when we serve the HTML, especially like for the new users or even for returning users after we redeploy some stuff, and again, we deploy pretty often, so they will hit that a lot. When we serve that HTML, we actually don't want any blocking requests like ever. So once the browser got the HTML, we are, want to like show it immediately. So that's, and if you have like any link rel style sheet, it's gonna be a blocking request. It, the browser will stop whatever it's doing. It will download that file and only after that it will proceed. So we don't want that. So we decided first, we're gonna make sure we don't have any external CSS files. Second, we're only gonna add the CSS files that are necessary for the initial render of the HTML. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so we only render, render whatever CSS is needed. So basically, if there's a sign up pop up, we're not, we don't want to add the CSS for that. If there's like some tooltip, which appears when you like move your mouse over. We don't want to include that CSS to the initial HTML. We're gonna add it later, but not kind of initially. So we, to reduce the kind of the HTML size, we send to the browsers. <coughs> and yeah, 
So the, the, the idea is we're going to have a, again, custom web pack loader. Yep. Uh, yeah. So Sorry. Uh -huh. Because we're already using caching a lot, right? So having an external CSS file, that I think would be good because you're going to cache those. But if you're inlining it, doesn't that mean you're necessarily downloading more? We're going to cache them for the returning users if we didn't redeploy. Because if we redeploy it, we change some CSS, we're going to redeploy it again, right? And also, it's another cool thing about having right there in kind of in JavaScript, so to say, or in HTML, that when we are like going from page to page via SPA, right? So we don't, in this case, we would need to download the CSS file, CSS file too. Here, we just like download the JavaScript bundle, that's it. It already includes all the styles it needs for that exact page, and yeah, basically good. Yeah, this was like not an easy decision, and we decided to give it a try, and so far, kind of happy with it. Uh, maybe the kind of the, uh, the uh, ROI is not that big, but kind of, also it's a cool tech, so we're kind of happy that we're using it. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> so again, we're gonna only render whatever is needed for initial uh, page render. And yeah, we are again achieving it by using custom webpack loader, uh, which is doing pretty much the same thing which I just showed you uh, before. So it's gonna generate that, yeah? When you load the new CSS file into the browser, are you guys using any manual um, clear on the cache and then load the new CSS or just uh, using clear uh, clearing the cache? Where exactly? Sorry. Uh, the browser, like I mean, uh, let's say um, I'm download. I mean, I'm opening the page. Um, I'm downloading the CSS. I'm just uh, caching the, the uh, browser, right? So next time, like I'm mean, not load the page. The CSS modified already in the server. So now you guys are like, I mean any manual techniques to clear the existing cache file or like just uh, we don't have css files at all okay. all css is bundled into html okay. okay i understand this kind of controversial <laughs> decision <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah that's why i'm kind of telling you about it i think it's fun fun stuff um yeah so how to ensure that we only add the css we need only for initial html so since we use React, we basically, every single time we instantiate React component, in a constructor, we actually can get the CSS for that React component and add it to head. And that's basically, that's the whole idea. And I'm gonna show you how it works again. So imagine you have like this CSS file. We have a button component and have uh, this pretty much like pretty simple CSS. And we have this component. <coughs> So uh, to use CSS there for this component, we basically import it, and there's going to be two objects uh, after we import that file. This is going to be a file that is generated by Webpack. So style sheets um, basically going to contain the contents of button CSS, and styles it's a map uh, with uh, class names. <coughs> so then in a constructor. We add that kind of uh, button CSS to the document head, and then we use um, those classes, cl class names, in the uh, in the render function of the component. So Webpack generates something like this. So again, it exports two objects. First is styles, and it's just a mapping uh, from kind of our class name, which you see in the CSS file to some kind of prefixed um, class names to avoid um, clashing of the kind of class names. So it kind of works as a somewhat poor man uh, shadow DOM. And the style sheets, there's two string method, which basically returns that CSS file from button CSS, just with uh, expanded um, kind of prefixed um, class names. And again, we also generate the typings file because we always do that. And the cool thing here is there's iStyles thing, iStyles interface. It basically contains all the class names uh, which we get from the CSS file, which means our class names are statically typed. If we make a typo in styles button, we'll get a compile time error. We can 
easily find usages of all the kind of the class names just by using find usages like the built-in ID functionality. And yeah, that's pretty cool too. And yeah, so this is how it, how it works. The problem here that those prefixes that kind of ensure that um, kind of our class names are unique, they could be pretty long. Uh, because like we basically use the path where the component located uh, as a prefix. So it could be like app dash pages dash components dash button dash button dash title. And like there's like this long class name. And yeah, it, it adds a lot to kind of the overall HTML size. But the cool thing, since we only have CSS that goes through this custom loader, we only do that in development. So in production, it looks slightly different. So we have the same CSS, the same, the same .tsx file, the same generated typings, but if we build, make a build in production, uh, the uh, kind of the output, the styles and style shot objects are gonna be slightly different. And since we are kind of going through the same pipeline, we actually know exactly what com classes kind of went through it. So we can replace them with some abbreviations, right? So usually it's like one, two, three letters. Like we start with A, B, C, D, etc. Uh, so for example, in this example, kind of our button actually gonna be what's like VA and the title gonna be WA class names. And we also kind of replace them in the stylesheet object there, in stylesheet uh, to string. So, and that actually reduces the uh, HTML size, which we spit out from Node.js, about 30, 50%. So, totally worth it. So, this is like what it usually looks in development, kind of in HTML, with like button dash button, button dash button dash title, and in production, it's just gonna be like VA, W, and stuff, uh, and etc. Whew. So, uh, this is pretty cool, and also it's actually pretty simple to do. Mostly because, again, there's uh, everything. It's like, you know, that's, that kind of, um, um, the, the, they say like whatever could be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. The, I already think like soon it's gonna be whatever could be written in Webpack will be written in Webpack. There is cool stuff for the Webpack. There is CSS loader, which is basically the kind of standard plugin for Webpack to load CSS, and it already has all that stuff. So it can extract the class names from the CSS and give it like to you as an object. It can do that prefixing and it can do that kind of replacing via yeah, that get local ident uh, kind of functionality, also already in CSS loader. We can use all the post CSS plugins we want, like post CSS next or the prefix or whatever, because we were kind of just basically adding our custom CSS loader after all the post CSS loaders and CSS loader, the standard webpack loader. So we are already kind of consuming the CSS that was already converted by all those plugins and then just kind of add some sprinkles on top of it and that's basically it. So our loader is like about just 200 lines of code and it could do all that stuff. So that's pretty amazing. Again, uh, cheers for Webpack Ray. And again, so another thing we have, very similar idea for optimized images. Works really kind of similar, same pattern, generating kind of Webpack module, generating the typings. And we have that kind of the banner image uh, object of like out of it. So, and kind of, while we are doing that, we're also kind of optimizing all the images via image mean. We're generating the WebP uh, version of the image. And if you actually never tried WebP, it's amazing. It really, on, on our images, it usually saves us about like from 30 to 50%. So WebP is usually like 30 to 50% smaller than exactly the same JPEG version. This is like huge traffic save, especially for us because like we have a lot of photos on the side. Um, yeah, and we have like some custom picture element which knows how to work with that uh, kind of objects which are generated by that asset loader. And for example, it says, okay, I'm in Chrome, so I'm gonna kind of pass some settings to that banner image so it would return me like a WebP version. 
if it's Safari, it's gonna return me like JPEG version, etc. So again, same pattern and really powerful and kind of another kind of example of using it uh, for uh, all the assets. All right, so another thing which we do, chunk responses. So still React takes a while to render it. Like, right, even like if there's no remote requests, it's still about 50 milliseconds while React kind of generates the all HTML for the page. But the cool thing, if you use a transfer encoding chunked header in HTTP 1, or if you just use HTTP 2, you can immediately send some stuff after you receive the response. Since we have that manifest JSON and we have like isomorphic app, we already know and we have like that custom router and so we know what page we are serving. We already kind of immediately know what assets we will need, even before kind of React starts to render whatever it's doing. So we immediately can send down the wire to the browser after we receive the response, some kind of preload links. And when browser gets those links, it immediately will start to download them. So by the time we return the HTML, which is generated by React, the rest of it, the, those bundles may be already gonna be there or gonna be halfway through. So another optimization, which probably gonna be uh, good enough, probably gonna be useful. So let's summarize a little bit. Um, so, so far we rolled out, we rolled out the isomorphic app it's all, all that stuff is under experiment, so we kind of still have our old site as well, of course. Uh, so we rolled out the isomorphic app, we rolled out no external CSS, we rolled out manifests, uh, that remote, that JSON uh, custom loader, and also the assets loader. So, so far, the, I think the best results we got from the inlining uh, data into the bundle, so that was a huge win. CSS, I'm not sure. Because maybe it's more, it's more like convenience because you only need to download the bundle to get everything. You don't have to like download JavaScript and then download CSS and stuff. Uh, it's kind of more the convenience, it's all there. And like isomorphic app and manifest really plays nicely together. So that was also a pretty big win. Um, yeah, so we're still going to uh, add the chunk responses and SPA mode. Still not there yet. The problem with this SPA actually not the functionality. The problem with SPA is pixels. So marketing team has a lot of pixels there they're using for their marketing, uh, I don't know, needs. And a lot of them kind of assume that when you click a link, you will get the page reloaded and on DOM ready, they will do some stuff. And for SPA, we don't have any DOM ready. So we need to make sure that each and every pixel kind of works and it takes a while. So still going to do that. Another cool thing that uh, we could probably look into, since we know exactly what bundles we have, we can actually, instead of kind of preloading them CDN, we can just like server push them right after HTML. So that would be a, probably a good idea to do. We could, serve, we could try to avoid any remote requests uh, from kind of Node.js Node that will allow us to cache all the HTML and serve from CDN. I guess users from Australia would be happy. Um, we could try service workers, which I'm frankly a little bit scared of because it's kind of caching HTTP requests and I'm really scared of caching because I've heard that caching sometimes need to be invalidated and I frankly have no idea how to do it right. Okay. So results so far. On average, so far we have two, three improve, like times improvement in performance for, gathered from kind of real world users. Only desktop so far, we don't have uh, mobile users included into the experiment. So for example, uh, the DOM ready event for the kind of the page where you have all the books and you can kind of change, or sorry, choose the design. So we, it went from 3.2 seconds to 1.6. Uh, product details pages when you actually can read about uh, some design and choose like the sizes and all that stuff. Uh, went from 4.7 to 2 seconds, the DOM ready event. And those numbers could even be better because the way how we set up the experiment since we're using kind of the framework currently, uh, kind of our somewhat halfway internal framework, this like internal framework slash optimizely, 
kind of this uh, weird combo. We add the 300 milliseconds on each page just because of kind of using that. So hopefully when we productize it, it's gonna be even better. But yeah, still the results are pretty impressive in my opinion. Uh, financial results, what's the outcome of that? And I have an answer for you. And the answer is <laughs> no idea. Basically because we're not done yet. And also kind of, we were actively de developing while kind of running the experiment. So it went up and then down and then up and then down. So far seems neutral. But again, we did the experiments that affects performance and seems like to actually make some outcome of it, out of it, you have to apply it through the whole site. Because like the slow pages seems to be ruin the, ruin the, the whole experience of the user. So it's fast, fast, and then they hit the slow page, it kind of starts to load, and then they disappointed, I guess, and don't want to spend money on our products anymore. Uh, but yeah, I still, uh, I don't have any financial results, sorry, but I still wanted to share some cool stuff we did so far, like tech-wise. Hopefully you find that, found that interesting. Again, love any feedback on that. I love the feedback on if you know, uh, if you ever used Next.js, please talk to me. Love to hear what it is and how to do that. Um, yeah, and basically you're gonna be here. I'm gonna go to that new bar and let's hang out there. <laughs> right, thank you. <clears throat> You're generating a lot of types for TypeScript, and so that all has to happen before TypeScript even like touches and compiles its own thing. So how do you achieve a two-phase compiling step in Web? Uh, there's a web loader for TypeScript. Okay. So <laughs> it stands but out. Can, can, like, I, I've never used that. So I've only used Flow, and Flow mm -hmm. is like a type checker rather than like a compiler. So mm -hmm. um, integrating Webpack and TypeScript uh, is very new to me. So in that Webpack loader, can you say what to load before TypeScript? Like, how, how do you... Well, in Webpack, you can start basically you build a pipeline, and uh, TypeScript basically stands after uh, the TypeScript loader. Uh, so kind of Webpack will resolve all those custom things first. So, so, so kind of along that line, I'm only into Flow 2, and I'd love to start a Flow versus TypeScript debate, but before we do that, uh, <laughs> So when I used it, it was like alongside. So I would have it in CI and you know, it would break it in that version or whatever. But in terms of like the change code, say refresh a page or copy it or whatever, like mm -hmm. that loop, the type checker was completely out of it. So for you, for development, does it type check on every? It type, so the VS Code has integrated type checker. So it runs along the way. Um, in VS Code, like some, um, how's it called, background process. Um, and we have the incre incremental compilation. We have the uh, type errors disabled because it kind of increases the compile time during development a lot. So I have like a shortcut in VS Code that kind of do the compiling through the kind of the, the whole uh, project and will show me the errors. But yeah, so the cool thing that VS Code and TypeScript, they really play nicely together. All right. All right, well, thanks again, Anton. Let's all take a five minute break and we can come back and do a quick just round up discussion and then head over to the locker stream. Sound good? Thanks again. Cool, thank you. All right.